Things you never hear. I wish that dental surgery would have lasted longer. I didn't stub my toe nearly hard enough. I wish my design was hit with overvoltage. So maybe you won't be able to avoid a seemingly never-ending dental surgery or a stubbed toe on that same step for the 400th time, but you can avoid overvoltage. But what can you do to avoid overvoltage? Well, if you're designing electronic equipment, there have been some changes in overvoltage standards recently that might just give you the guidance you need. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. If you need help with overvoltage for your next design, never fear. Chalk Talk is here to help. Today, my guest is Todd Phillips from Little Fuse. Todd and I take a closer look at the new IEC 62368-1 standard, the additional tests included in this standard, and why this standard allows for greater safety and design flexibility. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about this topic from Little Fuse. Hi, Todd. Thank you so much for joining me. Well, thank you for having me, Amelia. Okay, so we're talking about IEC 62368-1 over voltage requirements. But Todd, before we get started, I'm not sure I know about this standard. What kind of applications are we looking at here? Well, it's actually pretty broad. As of December 2020, this standard now includes all applications that were previously covered under two different standards, and then some applications that were not actually covered at all. So previous to December, designers had a choice that they could comply with 6236A-1 or those other standards which were shown here, but that actually is no longer possible. The scope of the standard actually includes a lot of IT equipment, so computers like we're using to to record today, notebook PCs, battery powered headphones, other audio equipment or routers, office equipment, the list goes on and on. And then additionally, it does actually bring into the fold electronic equipment used for entertainment and security, and then even as far reaching as some appliance related equipment. So the electronics that may be included in some smart appliances also now fall under IAC 62368. Dash one. My oversimplification of this would just be to say, you know, it covers electronic equipment. Okay, cool. So, Todd, what do we need to do to make sure our designs comply with this standard? Well, first, it's important to note that this standard takes a hazard based approach, which means that how a device is designed and where it's intended to be used determine how the testing and evaluation criteria then unfold. Often, protection components are included in the designs to help increase the long-term reliability and to help pass certain equipment level tests, such as electrical strength and clearance and creepage requirements. Related to that, as soon as you have protection components in, one important aspect would be then to figure out what the overvoltage category of the equipment is. So where the equipment will be used leads directly to the criteria used to select that overvoltage protection product and solutions. It starts by determining that what that overvoltage category is. This is based on where the device connects to the electrical grid. So the closer you are to the electrical grid, the higher the category number, in this instance, category four. And as you move further away from it or into the building, the category number decreases and then so too the hazards decrease. But to help us illustrate where this all leads, uh, we can think of a, a power adapter used to charge a notebook computer. 62368 provides guidance that these are over voltage category two type devices. And then using that knowledge combined with the line voltage where you would actually plug in either 120 or 240 like we show here, we can see that that leads us to a withstand voltage rating. In the case of 120 volts, the withstand voltage rating would be 1500 volts. And then for adapters that can plug into outlets up to 240 volts, that withstand voltage rating is gonna need to be 2500 volts. That seem, may seem like a kind of magic numbers right now, but that'll pay off later as we talk through an example of how to select those circuit protection components and then the standards that we need to test to. Okay, that makes sense. Now, Todd, are there any other kinds of tests that we need to be aware of here? Yes, there are. Another differentiator from previous standards is the addition of three tests related to the use of varistors and gas discharge tubes for surge protection. 
Varistors can wear out over time as they're exposed to surge events and eventually actually becoming a hazard themselves. And so the standard actually recognizes this and refers to them as a possible ignition source, but it doesn't leave you hanging. It actually addresses this with these additional tests, which are included then to ensure the safety and reliability for that end use equipment. The Varistor overload test applies two times equipment voltage rating. It starts with a test at a higher resistance and then stops when the temperature stabilizes. Subsequent tests are then run with lower resistance values so that the current actually increases through each of those tests, but they're stopped eventually when something opens the circuit, either actually a failure, which is not ideal and won't happen once you're doing agency testing because you've done previous testing. And in the past situations, a fuse or some sort of thermal disconnect or gas discharge tube or GDT or some other mechanism actually causes the test to, to stop and interrupts it. And so no, no further instances of that test would then be required. As you see here also, there's the temporary overvoltage test applied only to the common mode protection, but the test is pretty similar to the varistor overload test where various instances are applied with different parameters for voltage, current, and actually what's new here is that the test duration is actually defined. So after that test, as well as the same thing for the varistor overload test, the pass is really considered if the varistor doesn't cause any damage. In addition, we have the basic insulation test, which evaluates the electric strength of equipment with an unreliable ground, and which we'll touch on reliable and unreliable a little bit later. But just like all rules, as you see here, the story wouldn't be complete unless there were exceptions to those rules. So as briefly mentioned, the basic insulation tests, those are not required if ground is reliable. That's one exception. The other tests can be avoided altogether based on the sizing of the varistor. However, for most, when sizing the varistor to avoid a test, it actually has a ripple effect resulting in higher ratings on downstream components, which adds costs. So Todd, does Little Fuse have solutions in this arena that could help me with my next design? Yes, we do. And to help show how those solutions relate to the standard, let's look at a specific example being the universal power adapter, which is extremely common for IT equipment. These adapters allow for the same electronics to be used throughout the world, regardless of that line voltage. So they can accept anywhere from 90 to 240 volts AC, and is why you can take your power adapter for your notebook, plug it in here in the US, and then go to virtually any other country in the world and not have a problem with it plugging into the local wall outlet. We'll work our way backwards, first looking at the final solution and then showing actually how we arrived there. This table here shows multiple possible solutions. And what we want to show is how the process to highlight some of the differences where we result in a different solution. On the left, we see a power supply that has line and neutral connections. Sometimes these are referred to as differential connection. For the overcurrent protection, on these, we would recommend a small cartridge style fuse like the 215 series with a current rating of 3.15 amps. And then for the surge protection here, our lead recommendation is a 300 volt thermally protected MOV or sometimes referred to as, a, as the TMOV. And then on the right, we see a, a three prong example and, and really the difference is it adds in the ground wire connection in, in addition to the, the line in neutral from the first example. Our recommendation here is that the overcurrent and the differential mode protection that we previously showed, that those actually remain the same. And then for the mains to protect the earth connections, which is often referred to as the common mode, we recommend the combination of 300 volt MOV and a 3.3 kilovolt rated GDT for maintaining and, and complying with the standard. Now, some may choose actually to pair one MOV and one GDT for each connection of the common mode meaning that one MOV and one GDT from line to ground, and then another MOV and GDT pair from neutral to ground. And in that case, the same part numbers would be suggested. The only real change is that the number of components used would be more. And this configuration that we show, we just try to help reduce space and cost of the overall solution. Further, you may notice that the two MOVs that we added and are used for the common mode protection, they form a series connection for the differential mode, so from line to neutral. And if that combination provides sufficient protection for the other downstream components like capacitors or power semiconductors, then you can actually remove that TMOV from the protection scheme. But we rarely actually see this. I, I just wanted to touch on it because some astute viewers may see this. We actually rarely see this because then the, the combination of those two MOVs, they perform like a 600 volt MOV, which ultimately doesn't provide enough protection for most. 
So Todd, why would I choose the 215 series as the primary fuse recommendation? Well, ultimately, it has the best combination of specifications and has the highest maximum fault current rating of the available options. You know, maximum fault current rating, sometimes that's referred to as braking capacity or interrupt fuse rating. And it really tells you how much current the fuse can safely interrupt. So it provides the, the broadest appeal for most applications. If we back up a bit and we consider, you know, what is the purpose of the fuse there? It's really that we want to make sure to prevent damage due to overcurrent events and then also can help pass some of the fault testing that's required within the standard. When selecting that fuse, it's really important to remember that we work through a checklist of those requirements to, to make sure that it, we've picked the right fuse. You know, first and foremost, we want to make sure that it actually does its purpose so that it, it does protect when it needs to. But even just as important is we want to make sure that it doesn't take action when it shouldn't so that it doesn't nuisance trip. Many applications have predictable energy pulses that occur throughout normal operation. And what we really want to make sure is that the fuse does not open during those those predictable pulses because that would be considered you know a nuisance trip. And what we're able to do is since those are predictable, we can calculate a value called I squared T or amp squared seconds of the pulses. And then the fuse has a similar rating of I squared T. So we can compare the pulse I squared T versus the fuse I squared T and maintaining a, a proper ratio between the two we can feel confident that the fuse is not going to nuisance strip. And there's a whole section that we can go into for probably for a whole nother hour on, on how to work through that example. But suffice to say that, you know, for the example that we're looking at here, the 215 provides a sufficient amp squared second ratio. Next is we need to make sure that the voltage rating of the fuse is at least as large as the maximum rating of the power supply. So in our example, we need to find a fuse rated to 240 volts AC or higher. Next, we need to ensure that the fuse fits within the space allotted to it. And then finally, we need to make sure that the fuse meets any and all appropriate third-party certifications like UL or IEC, to just name a couple. And that leads us to the recommendation of the 215 series 3.15 amp fuse. Seen here also is the 392 series, which could be a good option if space requirements are a little bit tighter, but it does come with a trade-off that the braking capacity is a little bit lower. So that would just need to be an additional investigation to make sure that that's suitable for the application. Okay, Todd. So what about surge protection? How did you arrive at those recommendations? That's an excellent question and, and actually a little bit more complicated. First and foremost, I'd like to, to note there are many different technologies which can be used for surge protection. In, in all practicality, though, we found for universal power adapters that most often varistors and GDTs are, are used. And I'll touch on the broader comparison of other technologies to varistors and GDTs a little bit later on. But to continue working through the example, I'll just focus on the, the varistor and GDTs. So the first thing is, is to consider is the ground reliable? As I, as I alluded to before, a reliable ground connection has an impact on, on which solutions you can select. So let's first evaluate that. Well, to understand this, maybe it'd be a, a bit easier to see what is considered an unreliable ground. Wall sockets with a loose earth connector or a damaged ground terminal in the plug are considered unreliable. And then also anywhere that these cheater adapters are used and sold should also be considered an unreliable ground application. Which means that for most consumers, you know, in homes or offices and many commercial spaces, those ground connections are unreliable. And then the same would be true for our example. So if we go back to the slide here with the surge protection options, what we're able to see is, okay, first we know that it's unreliable ground. So the varistor can't be used in the common mode, or at least not alone, but it can be used in the line to line connection or the line to neutral. So as so long as they meet G8, which is a section of the standard, but then back to the, the mains to ground connection. This is one area that the standard actually gets very prescriptive and says that if it's a unreliable ground, the surge protection in the common mortar between mains and protective earth that you must use a varistor with a GDT. Okay, Todd. So when it comes to differential mode protection, what do our solutions look like here? Well, first, we should note that the varistor itself, they should comply with the, its own component standard, so meaning either shown here is acceptable. Next is to know that the standard requires 
that the minimum continuous operating voltage of the varistor, it needs to be at least 1.25 times the maximum voltage rating of the equipment. So as we continue with our example, that means that the MCOV of the varistor needs to be at least 300 volts. And then recall earlier, we, we touched on withstand voltage rating and, and how that's related to over voltage category. Well, well, here's our payoff for all of that analysis and discussion. The varistor needs to be able to handle multiple strikes of that 2,500 volts when it's applied as a combination wave where there's a current component of 1.25 kiloamps and those multiple strikes, the surge rating of the MOV actually relates to the diameter of the MOV. For us, an MOV with a diameter of at least 10 millimeters is sufficient to be able to handle the multiple strikes of that surge level. And then using anything larger in diameter would just add to the reliability of that application. Next up, we would need to look at that the varistor needs to pass the overload tests. To perform this test, a circuit similar to the image on the right is used. That's where you apply 480 volts as the source, and then various resistors are used throughout multiple tests to find when the, either the MOV fails, which would be a failure of the test, or that it causes some other protection either built into the MOV, as in the case of a thermally protected MOV, or external like a fuse or GDT. And then in our evaluation, we were able to find that a 300 volt rated thermally protected MOV, as we refer to sometimes as the TMOV, that passed the test, as well as a 420 volt rated standard MOV, both passed those tests. But for optimal surge protection, we suggest to use the MOV with the lowest voltage rating possible, which provides the best protection. So we recommend the smallest available TMOV, which is actually a 14 millimeter device instead of that 420 volt MOV. So Todd, what about common mode protection? What kind of solutions would you recommend here? Well, as we previously mentioned, with, since the ground is unreliable in that universal power supply, the standard says we need to use a, a varistor and a GDT together. Well, the sizing of the varistor, that remains the same as we just discussed for differential mode. So we still need to have an MCOV of that MOV as 1.25 times the voltage rating of the equipment and the surge requirements remain the same. So ultimately a 10 millimeter MOV rated to 300 volts would be the suggested solution for the individual component MOV. And then next, when it comes to picking the right gas discharge tube or GDT, we need to know that it needs to pass the electrical strength test. And then again, using that withstand voltage we discussed before of 2,500 volts, the GDT often has a range of its breakover voltage. And so we need to pick a GDT where its minimum breakover voltage is at least 2,500 volts or higher. And a GDT with a, a VBR of, of that can very easily pass uh, and very likely pass clearance and creepage requirements. Suffice to say that the GDT needs to meet that 2,500 volt as a minimum. Then to wrap up the selection, we just need to make sure that the series pair of MOV and GDT, that they can pass the overload and temporary over voltage tests as described by the standards listed here. And due to our evaluation, we can fast forward and say, yes, the 300 volt MOV combined with the 2,500 volt GDT they pass those additional requirements, so we can recommend those two solutions for the common mode. Okay, cool. Now, Todd, it looks like we have several different solutions when it comes to surge protection. Can you break them down a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. Those multiple other surge options exist, and we don't want to forget them yet as we move forward here. The technologies to consider for differential mode protection commonly are the TMOV, as we've discussed, a standard MOV, a combination actually of a side actor and an MOV together in a series pair, or a high power TVS diode. And then to complete the table, since we didn't want to leave them out, the common mode protection of the GDT and MOV, we also wanted to, to throw in the same chart just for a complete comparison. The common criteria to use as you're comparing each of these technologies would be the clamping voltage of the device, which actually shows how well the device can protect during a surge event, lower clamping voltage being typically better. There's also the let through energy of a, of a surge event. Again, lower is better. There's also then the leakage current, the lifetime after multiple surge events. So how long can it last through multiple events throughout its life? And then finally, the size and the cost of the device really do come into play. Using these criteria, the best combination we would come up with was, is the TMOV. It just kind of has the best balance of all of them. For extremely cost-sensitive applications uh, that may be able to handle that higher clamping voltage, the MOV may be another good consideration. Also, further, if there are applications where there are, is a need for better surge lifetime, so it can handle more hits of the same amount or the same level 
then maybe consider the side actor plus an MOV. And if the best search lifetime and clamping performance is, is absolutely necessary, then a high power TVS diode could also be a consideration. So then kind of bringing it back all together for our example, we just see that the recommended solutions as highlighted here would be the Fuse, we've got our TMOV for the differential mode, we've got the MOV and, and GDT then for the common mode protection on the chart there on the right. And again, these are just our lead recommendations. And, and as we would looked at in the previous chart, other options may be better suited for you based on specific design requirements or design of components used, as well as you know maybe it's intended for use in a different location. Those all can lead to different solutions selected. All right, Todd, this has been a lot to take in today. Can you recap your main points for me? Sure. There are just a few things to remember. So number one is that IC62368, it superseded those old standards. So where you could choose which one to comply with in previous times, that's no longer possible, but it does actually expand its use and it, it covers a wider array of applications that, that maybe previously weren't addressed underneath any standards. With its hazard-based approach, it may require new tests based on the components used in the design, as well as the intended location for its use. And then last, for those brave enough to read through the standard, it may seem complicated at first, but that actually does lead to a lot of flexibility as well as greater safety throughout the design of the system and ensuring that for the end user. So Todd, if my viewers want more information, what do you guys have for us? Well, actually quite a lot. If they navigate to mauser.com slash littlefuse, you can find catalogs, selection guides, app notes, data sheets, and a host of other materials to help in their design process. Excellent. Well, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me, Todd. Thank you. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about this topic from Little Fuse. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talks section of EE Journal. You can't miss it, it's right across the top. Or head on over to YouTube, youtube.com slash eejournal. <laughs>